And then we come to the similarities between the Apadna reliefs and the Parthenon frieze that may function more so on a subconscious level. The common experience one might have had when participating in a ritual procession at Persepolis and on the Acropolis. What we're looking at here on the Parthenon frieze are different scenes of a long parade from beginning to end, marching through Athens. Riders at the west end mount their horses and strap on their sandals, getting ready to take off. Horses, riders, and chariots speed along the north and south sides of the temple with the parade in full swing. Participants carry gifts and present sacrificial victims to the Divine Assembly at the east end, with the ultimate culmination of the festival and the parade being the presentation of Athena's new peplos. Athenian and allied participants walking alongside the Parthenon in the Panathenaic procession would look up at the frieze through the intermittent breaks of the colonnade and see a familiar representation. The same thing that you're doing right there, participating in a religious procession. And to help you engage with the frieze further, the occasional figure even looks out at the participants below. So the real-life participants in a ritual procession are invited to associate themselves with the events of the Parthenon frieze, the Parthenon itself, and the whole Acropolis. And at Persepolis, on the Apadna release, the same technique is used to encourage onlookers to identify with the figures represented in the artwork, and also with Persepolis itself. And the Apadna reliefs are thought to represent the annual festival of Nauraz, the Persian New Year celebration, when dignitaries of the subject nations were obliged to present their annual tribute. Not entirely unlike the Panathenaic festival during the Athenian Empire. So, just as the figures in the Apadna reliefs are shown lined up marching to their king in a ritual parade, so too would the real-life dignitaries and soldiers be parading during the festival of Nauraz. And those aren't just any figures in the Apadna reliefs. Their different styles of dress and the items they carry help us to identify them as emissaries of the various nations subject to the Persian Empire. Those very same tribute-bearing dignitaries and those very same Persian and Median soldiers who themselves once long ago walked along these quote-unquote portraits in relief as they brought tribute to the king. The Padna reliefs even helped to channel the tribute bearers in procession as they climbed the staircase to the Apadna Terrace, proceeding inward towards the king. And when seen in its entirety, all the hundreds of figures on the Apadna reliefs directly face the figure of the king, where he's already receiving a Median marshal and spear bearers. As seen here in this reconstruction drawing of the northern terrace of the Apadna, from Margaret Coolroot's 1985 article in the American Journal of Archaeology, the Parthenon frieze and the Apadna reliefs at Persepolis, reassessing a programmatic relationship. So we've seen how the Acropolis of the New Athenian Imperial Age and the Audience Hall at Persepolis share a functional similarity as imperial treasuries and centers for tribute from subject nations. They were also both festival grounds for annual parades when the tribute was received, and they both served to unite a diverse group of cultures under a single figurehead. In one case, the divine maiden and protector of democracy, Athena, and in the other, the Persian king, a living god. We also explored a similarity in the experience of these sites by their respective festival participants in that the Apadna reliefs and the Parthenon frieze both demonstrate the same effect of connecting with the viewer, having him or her identify with the religious and imperial function of the site. We don't see a lot of formal or stylistic similarities between the two sites, and that makes a lot of sense when you think that Athens wouldn't directly and literally want to mimic the Persian government. Instead, by metaphorically associating themselves with their most immediate imperial forebearers, the Athenians justify their ascent to the role of emperor over the eastern Mediterranean. By employing similar themes of tribute and the patriotic festival parade, Athens further manages to justify its claim in the eyes of the Ionian Greeks, who had long been familiar with these themes under Persian rule. And to bring it all home, Athens does all of this in the distinctly Ionian sacred artistic tradition of the Ionic frieze. How could the Ionians have possibly rebuffed their obsequious Athenian compatriots building bridges towards a new allied democratic Greece? Yeah, right. 
well, that concludes our long haul from Persia to Athens. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to visit ScarabSolutions.com, where you'll find the image library from the podcast and the ever-expanding bibliography in the additional resources section. And as always, you can also read the transcripts for each episode, plus search them in case there's something you know we covered previously but don't want to go back and listen to each episode until you find it. Plus, the transcripts also help you figure out how to spell all those strange ancient names I'm spouting. Also found among the transcripts is a list of links to more great Parthenon and Persepolis resources online. If you'd like to email me, you can do so at scarabsolutions at mac.com. And if you'd like to help me out, please consider offering your review of the podcast on iTunes. You'll find a link at scarabsolutions.com to visit the podcast in iTunes. Thanks for listening, and see you next time on the Scarab Solutions Ancient Art Podcast.